We're going to start with a gentleman by the name of Rocky. Tampa, Florida, on the Mark Levin app. How are you, Rocky? Hello, Mark. I'm doing well, and you are like my idol. I have learned so much from you. Thank you. And thank you for all the work that you put in. Mark, you, you are the rudder of political exactness. And I propose to you that we have a horrible image problem in the perception of political, um, viewing the perce- political spectrum. You know, it's left and right and center. And these fibbing liberals would have you believe that uh, Fox News is so right wing and yet sometimes they're left and center. So I got to thinking the Constitution should be our center point. And that's where the bird flies. It's right there on the Constitution. Everything to the left of that would be to the left and everything to the right of that would be to the left. Isn't this sort of what I've been saying for some time now? When you look at the political spectrum, it's really a circle. And on that line, not in the middle, on the line at the bottom of that circle, we constitutionalists slash conservatives, because we believe in the the founding principles of the country. To the left, as you go around, it gets more and more leftist, leftist, and then at the top, it is, um, you know, Marxism. To the left of that, as it comes back towards constitutionalism, you have progressivism and so forth. Then when you go back to the top point, you have some form of fascism, if you will. And then as you move down, you have, you know, this, that, and the other. But I could not agree more. I've espoused this myself, that I don't want to call us moderates or centrists, because that's, that's, again, they have their own definitions. We are, as you point out, we are the center of the spectrum. If you believe in the founding of the nation, we are the center of the spectrum. You and I and this, this magnificent, beloved, massive audience, we are defending the center. We're defending the heart and soul of the nation. We're not on any wing. We're not right wing. We're not extremists. We're nothing of the sort. So I agree with you, Rocky. By the way, is your real name Rocky? Yes, it is. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. You'll All see right, me buddy. running up and down the steps. And <laughs> All right, well, take care of yourself. Well, you won't see me doing that, that's for sure. Brian, New York, Sirius Satellite, Go. Hey, Mark. Um, so I just want to talk about how the, the idea that the tariffs will reduce a trade imbalance are, are based on the fallacy of the trade imbalance. You know, if you go back to when humans started trading, which was why we call it trade, it was barter. And what money does is, whether it's dollars or yen or euros or wampum or precious metals or whatever it is, it gives us a baseline to compare our values of things against Right. So we don't have to constantly decide whether my goat versus your tomatoes versus the tools that the guy down the street made and try to constantly figure out the values because we have a baseline. Exactly. If things are properly priced, there is no trade imbalance because you're getting a value in a product that you're paying, in theory, an equal value of money for. When you impose a tariff... Because let's stop. You Before you get to that... This is a very important point. Trade is, involves individuals or individual companies, that sort of thing. Countries don't trade, here's $100 billion, and now you only gave us $150 billion, therefore we have a $50 billion trade deficit. That's not the way it works. Nobody's pointing a gun to somebody's head who's involved in trade. So let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a producer. I need uh, 15 barrels of oil from uh, Saudi Arabia. I purchase 15 barrels of oil from Saudi Arabia, and I sell them nothing. Is that a trade imbalance? Nope. No. I paid a, a, a negotiated price for those barrels of oil. I need those barrels of oil to make my assembly line work. And I'm just, again, just a, a, a theoretical example. And yet, theoretically, we have an imbalance. Well, well, it's not an imbalance. That's called trade. Right. Now, you're quite right. I mean, the funny thing is, if people believe in the gold standard, the funny thing is, all these countries, and I don't buy this, all these countries, I buy the gold standard, I don't buy their argument, which is, okay, we have a, let's just throw out, $50 billion trade deficit with XYZ country that we buy, say, oil from. All right, so they have a bunch of green paper, and we have their oil. We ought to be celebrating that. Anyway, right. there you go. So, so then what happens is, if we, 
we, to use your, your barrel of oil example, if we impose a tariff on those barrels of oil, we created a trade imbalance because you're now, we are now going to pay more, but it's not worth more. Or I won't buy it. Well, true. Maybe, maybe well, I was going to expand. Thank right. you for your call. It's an excellent call, and I want, I want to double down on what he's saying. He was a great thinker. His name was Henry Hazlitt. And he wrote a little book on economics. It turned out to be a big book, not in terms of size, but in terms of its influence. He was a newspaper man, but anyway, he wrote a book called Economics in One Lesson. It's, I think it's over half a century old. You ought to get it if you haven't. Go on Amazon and get it. Economics in One Lesson. And in Chapter 11, he talks about it, about trade. Just a common sense guy. And I want to address what he says. I want you to hear what he says. And tell me if it makes sense to you right after the break. We'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Europe at one point, there were a million people in the street protesting him. The left in Europe is very stupid, like the left in the United States is very stupid. The left in many parts of the country, look in uh, Israel, they're stupid. They're just stupid. They're all stupid. Uh, but in any event, Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson, he wrote, let's look at this matter. Let's see the effect of imposing a tariff in the first place. Suppose that there had been no tariff on foreign knit goods, that Americans were accustomed to buying foreign sweaters without duties, and that the argument were then put forward that we could bring a sweater industry into existence by imposing a duty of $5 on sweaters. There'd be nothing logically wrong with this argument so far as it went. The cost of British sweaters to the American consumer might thereby be forced so high that American manufacturers would find it profitable to enter the sweater business. But American consumers would be forced to subsidize that industry. On every American sweater they bought, they would be forced, in effect, to pay a tax of $5, which would be collected from them at a higher price for the new sweater industry. Americans would be employed in a sweater industry who had not previously been employed in a sweater industry. That much is true, but there would be no net addition to the country's industry or the country's employment because the American consumer had to pay $5 more for the same quality of sweater. He would have just that much less left over to buy anything else. So the $5 wouldn't be able to go to buy something else manufactured by another industry and other employees. The consumer would have to reduce its expenditures by $5 somewhere else. In order that one industry might grow or come into existence, a hundred other industries would have to shrink. In order that 20,000 persons might be employed in a sweater industry, 20,000 fewer persons would be employed elsewhere. It's actually worse, but the new industry would be visible. The number of its employees, the capital invested in it, the market value of its products in terms of dollars could be easily counted. The neighbors could see the sweater workers going to and from the factory every day. The results would be palpable and direct. But the shrinkage of a 100 other industries, the loss of 20,000 other jobs somewhere else, would not be so easily noticed. It would be impossible for even the cleverest statistician to know precisely what the incidence of the loss of other jobs had been, precisely how many men and women had been laid off from each particular industry, precisely how much business each woman, uh, each particular industry had lost, because consumers had to pay more for their sweaters. For a loss spread among all the other productive activities of the country would be comparatively minute for each. So it would go unnoticed, but it would happen nonetheless. It would affect individuals and lives and businesses. It would be impossible for anyone to know precisely how each consumer would have spent his extra $5 if he'd been allowed to retain it. 
The overwhelming majority of the people, therefore, would probably suffer from the optical illusion that the new industry had cost us nothing. That it cost some people everything. And this brings us, he writes, to the real effect of a tariff wall. It's not merely that all its visible gains are offset by less obvious, but no less, real losers. It results, in fact, in a net loss to the country. For contrary to centuries of interested propaganda and disinterested confusion, the tariff reduces the American level of wages. Let's observe more clearly how it does this. We've seen that the added amount which consumers pay for a tariff-protected article leaves them just that much less with which to buy other articles. There is here no net gain to industry as a whole. But as a result of the artificial barrier erected against foreign goods, American labor, capital, and land are deflected from what they can do more efficiently to what they do less efficiently. That's why they need to be subsidized with your tax dollars. Therefore, as a result of the tariff wall, the average productivity of American labor and capital is reduced. That is, the money is not going where it would otherwise go on a voluntary basis towards other production, other inventions, other activities. He goes on, if we look at it now from the consumer's point of view, we find that he can buy less with his money because he has to pay more for sweaters and other protected goods. He can buy less of everything else. The general purchasing power of his income has therefore been reduced. Whether the net effect of the tariff is to lower money wages or to raise money prices will depend on the monetary policies that are followed. So in other words, you will lose the value of your wage to some extent because you're paying an artificially higher price for something. But what is clear is that the tariff, that is a tax, though it may increase wages above what they would have been in the protected industries, must on net balance, when all occupations are considered, reduce real wages for everybody else. And I would argue that it's even worse than that. It stymies an economy. You and I, the President of the United States, Wilbur Ross over at the Commerce Department, this pretend but buffoonish economist, or whatever he is, maybe he is one, Peter Navarro, we like to say, as conservatives, there is no way for one person or one group of people to know how to manage Americans, to manage a massive, multi-trillion dollar economy. And yet, when you deign yourself knowledgeable enough to know how to protect certain businesses, to improve certain businesses, to increase the output of certain businesses, you're no better than a leftist. Because you can't possibly have that knowledge. Remember on this program, a couple of times we've done iPencil. iPencil. How complicated a pencil is. What's involved in making a pencil? It's incredible. And it involves many, many nations. Many, many levels of production. All kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Well, imagine making a computer. Not a pencil. An automobile, not a pencil. A calculator, we still have those? Not a pencil. An iPhone, not a pencil. I can go on and on and on. And go on and on and on. This is the one area where I have a strong disagreement with the president and his Bernie Sanders type tariff policies and his Herbert Hoover type tariff policies. And you can observe that even among conservatives on radio and TV, how they have genuflect, genuflected and become protectionists. It's not America first to raise taxes on the American people. It's not America first to redistribute wealth this way. It's not America first to destroy far more jobs than you create or protect in any subsidized industry. America first is about liberty. Now you might say, what about all these other countries? They don't believe in any of this. You know what I say? Some of them do and some of them don't. And the ones that don't will become poorer as a result. The ones that don't, their citizens have less choices than we do. The ones that don't tend to be socialist 
or police states. The ones that don't, that's their problem. That's their problem. You do not, you do not create more of American industries, more wealth in this country, more opportunity in this country by attacking capitalism and attacking trade. When you have an enemy like China that steals your technology, that's a wholly separate issue, as you know, if you've listened to this show. I'm talking about with our allies. I'll be right back. 